Good morning. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out today uh, on this important topic. Uh, again, the title, Toxic Legacy, Has Agent Orange Hurt the Children of Vietnam Vets? Um, my name is Mike Hicksonball. I'm a military reporter for the Virginian Pilot newspaper down in Norfolk. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we came upon this topic and how we got here. Last year, the, the newspaper uh, spent, uh, I and several other staffers spent several months telling, retelling the story of the Vietnam War 50 years after the, our first, you know, the first ground troops uh, arrived in country and 40 years after the airlift out of Saigon. And in the course of that reporting, we talked to dozens of Vietnam veterans, got, you know, heard their stories about their time in combat, and we chronicled those over the course of several stories. And we also talked to them about what this war has meant to them and to society all these decades later. And uh, something that came up again and again was Agent Orange, and uh, we were, I was surprised to learn that there are still unsettled questions about the chemicals and its impact on veterans' health. And in particular, I, it introduced me to a topic that I'd never heard of before, the idea that a children, a, a child of a, of a veteran who was exposed could be harmed somehow. And as we looked into that, uh, we ended up linking up with ProPublica, a nonprofit journalism organization in New York. And we've been digging into this question for a year. And what we've found to this point is that there's still a lot that isn't known. There are thousands of anecdotes across the country of veterans and their children who feel as though, you know, the proof is, is there. I mean, th th they, they live these, these struggles. Um, but the science, for whatever reason, has not, uh, proof has not bared that out yet. And there's a ton of research that just hasn't been done. And so t today we're here to talk about that, uh, to talk about what, what's, what we don't know, what we do know, and, you know, once the science does show, if there's a link, what that means in terms of society's responsibility to the child of a veteran, you know, someone who did not sign up for war but is somehow affected by it. Um, so, and in, in case you have any doubt about the passion uh, and, you know, the way people are, are uh, affected by this issue, we have people in here today who traveled from as far as uh, the North Carolina border, uh, from Pennsylvania. One family, uh, father, daughter, traveled here from Mississippi last night to, to hear from policy experts, researchers, uh, VA official, to figure out, you know, what, to, to be a part of this conversation. So thank you all for, for being here. Um, the way this will go is we're gonna hear a couple, you know, firsthand stories and then we will transition to a panel discussion, uh, and then uh, at the end there will be time for question and answer, uh, audience Q&A with, with the panelists. But uh, first here's a video uh, from one, one family uh, affected. And I'm told, just to give a disclaimer, that this was recorded over the phone, so the audio crackles a little bit, uh, but should be good here. My mother said to the surgeon, my husband was exposed to Agent Orange, he was heavily exposed to dioxin. And the surgeon looked up and said, did you say dioxin? And my mother said, yes. And the surgeon said, that's the problem, and called the nurse and ordered an emergency CT. Uh, my father was James W. Clifford. Uh, he died in 2011, he was 64. And I can remember being little, like six or seven little, and thinking Agent Orange was a person or that Agent Orange was, you know, like a ghost. My brother was born in 77 with spina bifida. Agent Orange related AO spina bifida. Uh, and that, at that point, Agent Orange became a topic of conversation in my home. Uh, my brother had a little over 60 surgeries in his lifetime. He died at 34. 
What happens when you're in a children's hospital in the 70s and 80s is that you're on a ward and everybody else has spina bifida too. Uh, so you end up on a ward where everybody's got the same problems, right? Everybody has somebody who was in Vietnam. Everybody's got spina bifida. So I, I also think that there was, you know, well over a decade of just a lot of talk among the other parents uh, about where they had been, what was going on with their kids, felt deeply guilty about something that was not his fault. He didn't want to talk about it, most certainly not with my brother and I. He felt responsible. My father was killed by his service, by it, not even something so innocent as friendly fire, something that was known, understood, and done on purpose. And at the very least, he has earned the respect that comes with an admission of guilt. So, uh, We've been looking into this I issue. Knew these tapes existed. I knew my parents had Sorry, guys. Technical tapes issue here. When he was in Vietnam, and I searched for 15 years. I got you. Years. So we've been looking at this issue for uh, more than a year at this point, and you know, asking a lot of questions. And uh, some of you may have seen uh, a couple weeks ago, we kind of introduced the topic as, uh, by publishing a story of one uh, child of a veteran who has a lot of questions about this, this issue uh, named Stephen Katz, a photographer I work with at the Virginian Pilot. And he's gonna come up for a moment, just kind of uh, share part of his story and, and why this is important to him. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna apologize. Uh, <coughs> It's not the natural habitat of a photojournalist to be in front of the room. Uh, I'm more accustomed to being behind the camera. Um, uh, back in 2009, I was working uh, with an NGO called uh, Physicians for Peace in Vietnam. Uh, and I uh, began work on a, a bit of a side project that I had started er years earlier in the Philippines uh, on children with hydrocephalus. Uh, and just because of a translation, uh, a little miscommunication, I, I was taken to an orphanage uh, full of children who appeared not to have hydrocephalus. Um, and uh, it, it was it, it, the type of place where, where, where nightmares are born. It was just a dark, very, uh, there was no, uh, the only light was ambient light coming in from just these sort of little, little windows in the, in the cement walls. Uh, <coughs> and I remember sp particularly photographing this one child who was in a sort of a fetal position, wearing diapers and just sort of playing with a little piece of red yarn. And I'm photographing her. And, uh, and one of the people who worked at the orphanage ca comes up behind me and uh, said to me that she was uh, 34, 35 years old. And I, I was, you know, I've, I've photographed some pretty shocking things in, in my life, but that really just kind of blew me away because I wasn't, I wasn't uh, f very far from the same age. And, uh, and I'm being told that this, is, uh, this was an orphanage. Uh, I thought they, these were children. They, these were uh, people that were in their 30s. And, 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 uh, and, and you know, they were completely non-communicative. They were hitting themselves and moaning and, and, and uh, just going to the bathroom on the floor. And uh, I just, you know, I had, to, I had to know more about this. And was, we were able to track down a, a woman who was affected in the same way um, physically, but she she had all her faculties. She brilliant, um, and uh, that started uh, a, a project for me, uh, a, a documentary film project that um, took seven years, and we had released the film uh, last year. But what happened was uh, I, I was feeling really terrible while I was in Vietnam, and and just weeks after I got back, I needed to have uh, uh, emergency open heart surgery. Um, I had, had open heart surgery as a child. I was born with a, with a, a heart defect. Um, but, uh, you know, it was just, you know, I took it for granted. You know, growing up, you know, I had the heart problem. Uh, I developed other health problems. And um, I was just sort of the sick kid of, uh, of the family. You know, I have uh, um, older siblings, but uh, 
um, I, I became estranged with my father when I was when I was seven, and so I really didn't know anything uh, about him uh, except I, I knew that he served in in Vietnam, and uh, uh, and you know that m he and my mother had a terrible divorce and and that he was basically the boogeyman. So. Uh, so, you know, I, again, like, I just took for granted that I was sort of the runt of the family, the sick kid, and just, you know, spent my whole life, you know, dealing with, with health issues. Uh, and um, it was only when I sort of reconnected with my father 37 years later that um, uh, I, had, I found out his uh, exposure to Agent Orange. And, and the irony is, is uh, you know, here I am uh, working on a film about uh, second generation Agent Orange uh, you know, victims in Vietnam, and really, you know, Agent Orange was not on my radar screen. It wasn't something that I was pursuing, something that I really knew very much about. You know, I was learning more and more as we were doing this documentary film, but then to learn that that uh, th that I may, you know, uh, in fact be personally uh, affected, and it was only until uh, I had a son, and um, and uh, things and with my health had been changing, I went to uh, an endocrinologist from, uh, I have a bad thyroid, and I was having some, some symptoms, and I, I remember asking him, Doc, do you think I could have diabetes? Because I did what everybody does, you know, when you have symptoms, I Googled them, and, uh, and he looked at me, and he kind of giggled, and he was like, uh, no. <laughs> and I was like, are you sure, because this and this and this? And uh, he's like, you were in my waiting room, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, you don't look like any of my other patients. And uh, he's like, look, you're tall, you're fit, you're trim, you're young. And uh, I was like, well, while you're doing the blood work on my thyroid, do you mind just checking? And three days later, I get a note saying, you've got diabetes. And, you know, it was shocking to me. Uh, a couple months later, I developed uh, a form of neuropathy in my, <coughs> my hand. And so rediscovering, like being reintroduced to my father became uh, sort of a, a change between learning who I was and now wanting to learn what I am. And, uh, and it's particularly, you know, motivated because, you know, I owe it to my son to find out what's going on. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so, you know, this has become uh, as much of a, a story that I'm working on to something very personal and something that I believe in very strongly. <coughs> because you know, if there's something uh, wrong with me that I don't know about, as well as my friends now, it's, it just seems the right thing to do, just to be straightforward. And that's why I'm very blessed to be working with extraordinary truth tellers like uh, Mike and Charlie and the folks at ProPublica and my colleagues at the Virginian Pilot. And, you know, I just hope we can try and figure out why so many of us are, are so sick and, and just don't know why. So anyway, thanks for being here, and I appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to introduce them. So I'm delighted to be joined by such a distinguished panel today to talk about um, whether or not there are multi generational health effects of Agent Orange. And I think. It's important to note from the outset that Mike and I are going into this wanting to answer questions and not coming in with a preordained mindset about um, what there's a lot of open questions about. But, but that's why we've gathered some of the top minds to talk about this and brainstorm and, and just learn what, what there is that's known and what isn't known and how this all fits together. So let me introduce my panelists. Next to me is Dr. Linda Spoonster Schwartz, who spent and served two tours in the Air Force during the Vietnam War as a nurse in Japan, right? Right. And subsequently conducted research on Agent Orange. And that predated her time at the US Department of Veterans Affairs, where she is the Assistant Secretary for Policy and Planning. So she approaches this with um, you know, a, a multi-tiered level of understanding. And so uh, we're very excited to have you here. And in your role at the VA, you help you provide the VA decision makers with advice and counsel on matters of policy and organizational strategy. So thank you for being here. 
Next to Dr. Schwartz is Rory uh, Riley Topping, who is the founder of Riley Topping Consulting, where she provides strategic solutions to her clients um, using her knowledge of veterans law and policy. And she sees things similarly with from a variety of vantage points, uh, having served at the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims uh, as a law clerk, having served time with the National Veterans um, Legal Services Organization, and similarly serving as staff director for one of the subcommittees of the House um, Committee on Veterans Affairs. So she's seen this through the legislative branch, through the executive branch, and as a uh, advocate for veterans. So thank you for being here. Next to Rory is Heather Bowser, who's the co-founder of the Children of Vietnam Veterans Health Alliance, which is a group, um, as the name suggests, of uh, children of Vietnam vets. And it's a strong group of about 3,700, 3,800 um, children who um, are, they're created to support children and grandchildren of those exposed to Agent Orange, uh, and are committed to educating others and finding answers about possible health consequences. And Heather um, herself is the child of a Vietnam vet, and we're eager to hear your story and those of your members. And finally, um, last but not least, Dr. Kenneth Ramos, who was chair of the most recent panel of the Institute of Medicine Committee on Veterans and Agent Orange. And as committee chair, um, he was reviewing all the available research on the herbicide and making recommendations to the VA. Um, and he's also associate vice president for precision health sciences at the University of Arizona Health Sciences. And I saw recently you were named interim dean of the UA Phoenix Medical School. So a guy with a lot of different hats <laughs> on. So uh, thank you all very much. Um, so I, I thought it was interesting. Last night, Mike and Stephen and I were walking. And we walked past the US Department of Veterans Affairs building. And, and on the building, there is a saying from Abraham Lincoln, which really struck me and I think is interesting in the context of this discussion. It said, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. And, and to me, it was striking in the context of this conversation because traditionally when we think about war and its effects, we think about um, people who are injured in that war uh, and what happens to them and if they uh, unfortunately die, what happens to their survivors. And the question of multi-generational effects of Agent Orange throws a very different wrinkle into that. And there, in that quote, there's not really, you don't, it doesn't envision sort of a conversation about a lingering health effect that isn't so much directly born at the time. Um, so maybe the first question is just, um, based on what we know now, uh, to each of you, do you believe that there is a multi-generational effect of Agent Orange exposure, and why or why not? And I, I thought I'd start with Dr. Ramos. So uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to be here. I think this is a very important topic, and I think one that's uh, not only generated a great deal of uh, interest as evidenced by the presentations that we've had, uh, but importantly, I think uh, a topic that raises uh, the conscience of the nation, you know, in, in very uh, significant ways. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of the dialogue. So you asked the question, what do I think in terms of multi-generational effects? I, I can tell you, uh, answer that question in two ways, uh, two parts to it. Uh, the first one is, um, I, I do believe that the science that we have now uh, points to the idea that there are uh, traits that could be carried over generations. And of course, that's very consistent with the whole principle of genetics, right? Uh, so it's not very surprising the idea that parents pass on genetic traits, whether it be in the way of structure of the DNA or whether it be imprints on the DNA that can be carried forward into future generations. And in fact, there's a vast field of study uh, that's emerging looking at this very principle, which is how much of uh, uh, the health status of an individual reflects genetic contributions that came from previous generations, not just the immediate parents, but even before that. And there's a science that's, that's uh, developing you know, to that effect. And so if you take that piece of the question, uh, sort of that part of the answer, and uh, and answer, yes, there could be multi-generational effects that come like that. Then if you add the piece of Agent Orange, uh, that's when uh, the question becomes sort of a different answer because the science does not yet support the idea that uh, exposure to Agent Orange 
has been associated with its good degree of certainty with health outcomes in uh, the children of Vietnam veterans. Now, the problem with that answer is that that doesn't say that there isn't an effect, right? Because uh, as I've pointed out before, when I've spoken with many of you in the past, the science to be able to answer the question really isn't there. And, and we all need to be mindful of that. Uh, that, that the, the scientific studies that have been conducted, uh, whether it be animal-based studies, whether it be human studies, whether it be epidemiological studies, have not yet provided the evidence that one would expect to have to be able to answer the question in the affirmative. Uh, I'm going to come back to you, Heather. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, do you want to sort of address this? Uh, you know, it's interesting because I um, came across articles that from Yale, from 2000, where you were recognized for your work in this area. Uh, and the headline of it was YSN, Yale School of Nursing Scientists, still uncovering Agent Orange's harmful effects. This is 2000. We're 16 years later. Uh, um, and you've done some of this research yourself. So where do you, uh, what is your thought on, on if there is a multi-generational effect? Well, yes, I, um, um, I have done a lot of uh, studies, and one of the studies was we did a secondary analysis of the ranch and data with Dr. George Knaffel, who is at the uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel. Uh -huh. And um, looking at, we were, we were given uh, some really good uh, measurements of uh, the ranch handers were the people that actually did the spraying. And um, the Air Force, and I am retired from the Air Force, so I was interested in exactly how much they had done. They did quite a bit with biological specimens uh, taken over time. And they, they did not necessarily analyze them. That was the big disappointment yes. of that data and those samples. And they also used a strange, they didn't use a, um, the definition they used for exposure was, it, it, it was not exact. It, it was not, uh, it cut out a lot of people who actually had levels of dioxin in it. So let me just go back and say that Dr. Knafel and I, and we presented this, uh, the, our findings to the International Conference on Dioxin. And we have found suggestive evidence that it, it, it would, um, what we found were two of the really basic and most important variables of the whole thing was the age of the individual at the time. And if you remember, the average age of a soldier in Vietnam was 18. Yes. All right, so that meant that 50% of the people before were less than 18 and those who were over. So they, many of them were, had not reached maturity. So we found that as a variable. And we also found um, the number of times that they were in Vietnam and the months, the number of months that they were in Vietnam. And it was suggestive evidence. We did not go into basic, we did not have it, uh, enough to really kind of say specific birth defects, but we did find um, that there were a higher rate in the men, uh, the offspring of the men who served in ranch hand. Having said that, the science then was very imprecise compared to what we have today. And also, the modern battlefield begs the question that we follow this. Because uh, I, having spent a great deal of my life working with Agent Orange and being with veterans and with women veterans and the children of, women, uh, of, the children of veterans, let me just say that the state of the science has evolved so much better I mean, when you think about a mass spectrometer back there, it was, well, maybe half as big as this room. So it seems prudent and pragmatic to begin to look at this not just for Vietnam, but to look at it for the battlefields of the world. Yeah. Um, Roy, do you want to jump in on this question in terms of your perspective? Um, most of your work has been with veterans themselves seeking coverage. Um, how often do you hear from the veterans about their children? And how does that shape your thinking on this? You know, we hear from veterans' children fairly often, actually. And so I think that there's enough awareness, um, or awareness is percolating that there may be some of these effects. And 
as a lawyer, you're, you have to base your decisions on the evidence. So as Linda and Dr. Ramos both <coughs> stated, you know, it's unfortunate that we didn't have the scientific technology that we have today, um, that data wasn't tested in the way that we wish that it was. But I think when you hear enough of these stories, it, it goes beyond coincidence to there's something here. Um, even today, just Stephen told a very powerful story. It's hard to sit there and hear that and say, no, not connected. No evidence. I just, I, I don't think that that's, um, regardless of, of the scientific evidence and what we have and don't have, I think if you hear enough of these stories, you start to get a sense of there's definitely something going on here. Perfect tee up for you, Heather. <laughs> Join the conversation with, with um, your experience and sort of the perspectives of your group on this question. Um, so my father served in uh, 1968 to 1969, the year that Agent Orange was sprayed the most and the heaviest. My father's base was about 15 miles away from Benoit, which is where Operation Ranch Hand was based at that time. Um, his, he was on Long Bin base. He served in the uh, U.S. Army. And they, their base was sprayed regularly. Um, and in general, the uh, planes coming back from short missions from spraying Agent Orange would oftentimes dump in the river right alongside their base and also in the ponds and things r surrounding Benoit Air Base. With that said, uh, people sometimes believe that it's just the, the soldiers that were in the jungle who were sprayed. However, in this um, situation, their water was contaminated, so their milk was mixed in it. They showered in, uh, in water that was um, heated in barrels left in the sun. Um, they, uh, their clothes were washed in it. It was contaminated, and so a lot of veterans on bases also were very exposed and very um, made sick. I was born in 1972 after my mother had two miscarriages. I was born three pounds, four ounces, and my, the doctor said that if they're that messed up on the outside, they're usually that messed up on the inside. And thankfully, I'm, I'm okay, but I was born missing my right leg below the knee, several of my fingers, my big toe and my left foot, and my remaining toes were webbed. My parents had no idea. There was no ultrasound and that kind of stuff, so I made kind of a shocking entry into the world. But I'm a founder of Children of Vietnam Veterans Health Alliance, and we have about 3,700 members, 800 members in our support community. And, our, and there's stories like Stevens, like mine, like um, my friend Chelsea who's here, like uh, Leslie was here too. Um, our stories are very similar, very similar stories, very similar birth defects, very similar health issues later. And I'll just add that, you know, before the internet, before, you know, 24-hour news cycle, there were stories coming from Vietnam, from our allies in Australia, and from the United States, from North Vietnamese soldiers and South Vietnamese soldiers, that there was something wrong with their children. This isn't something that everybody just got on the bandwagon and started saying. This was trickling from all these countries at all these times, and it has continued through, through all of this time. Neural tube defects, um, shortened limbs, webbed toes, missing limbs, extra vertebrae, missing vertebrae, um, autoimmune disorders, you know, the list goes on, endocrine, a lot of different types of issues. And one thing I always, when I'm speaking a lot, I lead out, Every war previous to Vietnam, pretty much, and especially, you know, you think World War II, Korean War, uh, World War I, there was a baby boom after the war. Where was our baby boom? My parents, first two born, died. Where was our baby boom? Hmm. So, last I checked, this is 2016, and we are a long time from the war, and what we've just heard is that there's been um, not uh, enough research to answer this question. In fact, in the 2014 IOM report, it says the research into this question has been extremely sparse. Those were your words, not mine. Um, so that begs the question, why? Um, why are we this far away and we're all talking about the need for research? Like, So certainly one explanation has been raised that the technology, the capability to conduct some of this research is more recent, but at the same time, you know, as Mike and I have made calls, it's not as if all of this research is currently underway. Um, you called for additional research. Why isn't this research being done, Dr. Ramos? You know, that's just, you know, a very complex question because uh, uh, there is 
scientific aspects to this, there is technological aspects to this, and there is policy aspects, you know, to the process. And so, uh, oftentimes, as you know, those worlds live in silos, and and I think reports like the one that we put out are is essentially intended to be able to to bring those silos uh, uh, together and to uh, recognize where there's gaps in information. So. Uh, repeatedly, I think these reports, not just the 2014 report, right. but previous reports, you know, have called for uh, additional uh, resources to be able to uh, carry out uh, uh, our mandate, you know, and to be able to, to gain some answers to the questions. Something that I think is going to be important for all of us to, to recognize, however, is the fact that revisiting what happened 50 years ago, 40 years ago, is essentially impossible, right? We're not going to be able to scientifically go back and reconstruct what could have happened 50 years ago. We're going to have to reconcile you know, to that and focus our efforts on the prospective approach to this, which is how do we taking advantage of modern technology and, and additional knowledge move forward in gaining answers to some of these critical questions that we have. And so my, my, my call to action, if, if I may, is that, that we focus our energies on that. What can we do now, taking advantage of the resources that we have now, to begin to answer questions related to uh, Agent Orange as well as other uh, uh, military service connected uh, you know, uh, outcomes, health outcomes. You know, as you know, Agent Orange is but one of the things that probably we need to be concerned about. And I think as we move forward and lay a plan forward, we need to be able to uh, uh, incorporate uh, uh, those aspects to it. Uh, the other uh, element that I think I would answer in your question, and this is the last comment that I will make, is that we, we also need to uh, recognize that occupational exposures are a very complex slew of uh, uh, elements, you know, and that one of the biggest challenges that we will always face in attempting to reconstruct in a study setting an occupational exposure is the fact that you might never be able to truly recreate that exposure in a way that is identical to the, uh, to the real life setting. And so those are some of the caveats that, that we all need to uh, be mindful of as we lay a path forward. And uh, my presumption, given you know, the efforts of you know, uh, individuals such as yourself, ProPublica, you know, and other groups, that, that we've, I think, raised level of consciousness to the point that hopefully something will happen uh, in, in the years to come. So let me follow that up before I ask other people to join, and that is, um, what specifically do you think can be answered now? So you've said what can, you know, the, the challenges, but what, what are the questions that you think actually, where we are today in 2016, that research can be done to provide us answers on? You know, um, so I think you could divide that probably into three bins. Uh, and I'm trying to stratify information so that as we all think about this and reflect on these questions, hopefully it's easier to kind of place the information in the right compartment. So I would say there's three aspects to what could be done. And of course, you know, you could almost amplify this exponentially. But the first component to it is the biological underpinnings of the question that we're trying to ask. That's one important aspect that needs to be answered. What do I mean by that? A very controversial aspect of uh, transgenerational inheritance relates to male versus female exposure. Huge, very complicated aspect. A lot of the data that's being accumulated up until now in the context of multi-generational events has primarily focused on the female. And so, so there's growing evidence that a maternal exposure, a grandmother exposure, could actually impact health outcomes in uh, the children of their children. Uh, 
but that same level of confidence is nearly completely lacking for males, right? So very few studies have been done studying uh, male transgenerational inheritance. The way that males and females undergo their cycles of reproduction, as we all know, are different, right? Women are born with a set of eggs that sort of they carry with them through you know, their lifespan. Men make germ cells uh, on a regular basis. So that's a huge aspect you know, that provides difference. So that whole framework of biological underpinnings of transgenerational inheritance for males and females is an area that we could do something about. The second aspect to it um, uh, almost uh, recapitulates what we've already done uh, in the context of epidemiology, uh, right? So, so because we cannot engage so easily in human-related exposures, so how do we take advantage of, of cohorts that exist that provide a framework for we could begin to answer some of the questions? Where have we been limited in the past is that those involved in deployment, those involved in follow-up, those involved in uh, decision-making never anticipated that we would be dealing today, 50 years later, with the kinds of questions that we're dealing with now. But of course, today is a new day, right? So what this calls for is, um, and I think it's something that we emphasize repeatedly in our report, and that is that we need to put in place the right structures that will allow us to collect the data that we need in a proactive way rather than in a retrospective way, right? It's very difficult to go back 50 years down the road to try to recreate what could, what might, what did happen 50 years before. But what we could do is as we think of new conflicts, as we think of new potential exposures, we can now put in place the right structures that will enable us to collect the data as we engage in the process. When that happens, then you're not gonna be able to encounter the problems you know, that uh, uh, have been pointed out before, which is we have trouble really interpreting the data that we had because the right measurements were not done, because the right data was not accumulated. So hopefully if we can start preempting a lot of this decision making, we can now begin to accumulate the data that we need real time. And, and part of this of course calls for a, a stronger linkage between deployment and comeback, right? You know, we, we cannot wait to get baseline data after the, after the uh, military personnel comes back from conflict. We have to be collecting data while they're on the field and even data before they go off you know, on service. So I think that whole, you know, we're gonna have to reframe the way that epidemiology is done, in this case for military personnel, right? Because we all now know all the dangers and limitations that come from trying to collect data after the fact. And then the third, I think, aspect to um, your question that I think we need to think about is um, this whole idea of taking advantage of new technology to anticipate what the questions might be, not now, but later on, right? So start creating repositories of, of biological material. Start, uh, you know, uh, uh, collecting data on the newest measurements that uh, are available now on the basis of modern technology. This whole idea of precision, you know, approaches to health. Um, and the reason for that is if we, if we are creative in the way that we do that, we might be able then to have in hand information that we don't even know what the value of that information is today, but that we might be able to take advantage of in the future. So as I listen to you answer that question, Heather, I, and as you listen to that, it, it makes it sound like the three areas of study that Dr. Ramos is talking about may not, though, answer the question that you want to know and that your members want to know, which is about sort of the exposure that their parents faced and the effect that it's having on you and your colleagues. Correct. Um, I mean, I feel um, very strongly about what he's saying in the, fact, in, in, in the regards of, I want ne uh, uh, never for another service person to have to go through the struggle 
to watch what's happened with their family to ever happen again. And if there are things in place that can protect our military members from something to have to go through this situation, I'm all for that. But this is, this is the issue with the research and science, and this is something that I don't think the public understands. It's research takes decades. Yes. I mean, once you have, if you're going to do a study, even if you were to find out, if, if we just looked at, you know, one thing that maybe Stephen mentioned or one thing of me, it takes decades for each one of those things. I'm 43 years old. How much more time should my family have to wait? So yes, I understand this, and this is good for the future. However, we, we need to figure out something here now. So we're going to have plenty of time for questions. We have a big, long question and answer session after the panel. So please save the question. Um, Dr. Schwartz, um, do you, you know, some vets that I've talked to and children of vets that I've talked to have said that um, they believe the VA does not want to know the answer to this question because they don't want to um, deal with the consequences of an answer and the, um, you know, the compensation consequences of an answer. Can you sort of address that? I think since the uh, discussion has come up about having a study in real time today, um, I am, I'm, I'm not, I am, I want to be very careful what I say because um, I have my own feelings, okay? But the point is I have not heard one person at VA say that. Say what? That they don't want to know the answer to this question, that they don't want to do the research because um, just being here and hearing again and knowing who we're talking about, I believe that these individuals deserve an answer. I believe that we need to at least ask the question. And I, I believe that VA is at that place where they are saying that as well. This is the right thing to do. And although we may not have all of the wonderful information, we have some. And so let us at least take a stab at this. And it is, as he pointed out, it is a complex issue. But um, I am a nurse by trade, so you can see that coming through. But at the same time, there is, there is far-reaching consequences for the people that are serving today. And in answer to your question, I'd like to talk about the um, individual Longitudinal Environment Record, ILER is what it's called. And it's a joint um, venture with DOD right now. Um, it's been in the works for about three years. It's not ready to go live yet, but what it basically is, and I am one who believes in registries, but I believe in registries that collect data and information and don't just take <laughs> names and addresses. Exactly. So that we, and I also believe that we should be looking at trends um, from a purely epidemiological point of view. But the ILR will be taking the information, just as you described, from our individuals who are serving in the Department of Defense, and it will become part of their um, medical record. Now, we're, they're hoping to go live in the next, I think, four or five months. I have been uh, a, a big proponent of this because it, it, once we have DOD's interest, and it has to be their interest, these are their people and these are their families. And VA is, is a willing participant in this because it will help us. It will help us to know and to be able to do the right thing. So, so many follow-up questions, I'll stick to two of them. One is, you said you have not heard within the VA anybody who opposes this, but what is the VA actually doing to conduct this or support this research? You know, if there's not an opposition, is there an active involvement in ensuring that this research involving Agent Orange is being done? Well, some of the uh, recommendations that came out of the last study uh, about uh, embarking on a design, and, and, and that was a recommendation uh, of, a, of how this study would look, I'm, I'm happy to tell you all that we're not waiting for everybody to, uh, a decision to be made. VA has moved forward on that. We are now working with the, the um, National Academy of Science and, and looking at what would that design look like. So that's, that's a pretty positive um, motion. And um, we are looking also at the last report uh, that you produced. And uh, I've seen many of those reports, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Every and, two years. <laughs> and um, 
So I believe this is a very positive step under Secretary McDonald and with the assistance of Dr. Shulkin, uh, this is moving forward much faster than you saw in the past. Uh, one more follow-up, and then I want to bring Rory into the conversation. Um, the VA has a registry, an Agent Orange registry, which is gather, gathers information from those who serve. They're entitled to an exam, and that exam yes. uh, has been provided now for a couple decades. People have been able to get this exam, and it uh, doesn't qualify them for benefits. Right. It's detached from the benefit process. But they go and spend a day right at a VA medical center, answer questions, get looked at, I don't know if you're familiar with this process. I'm familiar with it, but I don't think that's what happened. Oh, okay. I, I think that the, when the registry first started, it was just your name and address. That's what I was suggesting. Yes. And you were given a zero rating. So people who are coming in for these exams, that's following them, but I'm not sure. I think it's mostly to see about disability compensation more than a study. Well, what's interesting, uh, and Mike and I were asking about this, is so far about 700,000 vets have gone through an AO, have, are listed in the Agent Orange Registry. Uh, and we were asking questions of the VA about whether or not um, research was done on that was re there's a registry code sheet. So for every veteran who goes in, this is a little bit technical, but they answer questions and how many kids do you have and do any of the kids have birth defects and how many kids did you conceive before the war? How many kids did you conceive after the war? Like a whole variety of questions. And we asked, has any research been done on it? I wish I could tell you, give you an answer, but I don't know the answer okay. to that. But I can get back to you on that. All right. Um, but the answer we were told intriguing. is that, what we were told was no research had been done on it because the VA didn't see the value in the registry because it was self-reported. And it seemed, at least to, on, to us, that this was a question which you're sitting on data from 700,000 veterans. Um, isn't there at least a curiosity to look at what is in there and if can something be said from it? Maybe um, you're not the right person to ask the I'm question. I'm not the right, right person. Okay. But let me just say this. Uh, you've picked, kept, picked my interest in it, and I will be looking into it because many of my friends served in Vietnam. I did not serve in Vietnam. And um, when the uh, registry was started, I, we had no idea at that time what the fallout would be 50 years later. And when you talk about the self-report, there, if there, if there is a, an information documented in their medical records uh, to verify this self-report, then it's worth looking at. Rory, uh, if multi-generational effects can be proven, what is the VA's responsibility, and can it afford that responsibility? As you were on the House um, committee, um, there was always a question about cost and about, you know, can the VA afford whether it's Camp Lejeune or the Blue Water vets? Um, but say, you know, you're at a point where some there, some of this stuff can be proven. What is the VA supposed to do? Well, I think that their responsibility is exactly your opening quotation, to care for he who bore in the battle, his widow, and his orphan. And so that includes the children of veterans. And as you acknowledged, um, we see that in all of the scenarios that you just mentioned. There are effects for family members, spouses, children. And if there was an unintended consequence, I believe VA does have a duty to take care of folks in that situation. And if it can be proven, then it seems like a no-brainer. Um, yes, cost frequently comes into play, but when you have unequivocal scientific evidence that shows a connection, uh, cost shouldn't be a factor in, in holding those types of benefits up. Um, we saw that in 2010 when VA added additional presumptive conditions. They did that through the regulatory process. They didn't go through Congress. Um, yes, there was an added cost, and that was always a point of contention. Um, I'm an administrative law purist, so things that can be done by regulation shouldn't be done by legislation. And so that was an area where we clashed in saying, you know, VA, you can do this. You don't need Congress telling you to do this. You have the authority to do this. And yes, the regulatory process is lengthy, as is the legislative process. However, there's a lot that VA can do on its own. Um, once they have this information that doesn't require legislative intervention. But do they do it? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> do you want to elaborate at all? <laughs> um, well, again, you know, using 2010 as an example, it was the right thing to do. Um, then Secretary Shinseki came out and said that several times. Um, there have been other scenarios where, you know, the memo that you and Mike reported on where they said, oh, we don't know if we want to do this because of these extra concerns. So I think. Everybody has a hope that VA will do the right thing, um, 
they have their own challenges internally that, that they have to confront. But um, things like forums, such as the one that you're having today, where you raise awareness, I think all of those things go towards uh, encouraging VA to do the right thing. Dr. Schwartz. I just wanted to say, because I was interested myself in that, and so yesterday um, I got from our veterans benefits that as of the end of the fiscal year 14, there are over 1,176 beneficiaries receiving this compensation, and uh, the benefits total $20.9 million. And you're talking about um, children of vets? Yes. So these are children of both men and female vets who right. have spina bifida, as well as children of female vets who have about a dozen right. other conditions. And, and let me just say that the, those uh, additional categories that were uh, were given to women veterans came from a study that VA did. It was not uh, congressionally mandated. So there was a chance. Exactly. And, and but, I think that's another mm -hmm. thing. Let me yeah, just, just say that you can, uh, and I, you can talk to anybody in VA and they will have an opinion on this. But the final analysis is what VA really does. And I can tell you as someone who has come from the, uh, the grassroots to this position that it is a very advantageous time for things like this to happen because there's more of a willingness and a desire to do the right thing. Dr. Ramos, were you going to chime I in? guess the only small thing that I would add um, is that one way to address the question that you, that you posed is uh, partnership and coalitions. Uh, I think a part of the problem in the past has been that the, that the uh, VA has been very inward looking, you know, and inward focused in the way that they have handled, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the issues at hand and, and the creation of coalitions and partnership across different sectors, including the academic sector, would be a very powerful way to begin to get at some of the uh, call to action that you're trying to incentivize in this process. So, so I mean, some of the vet vets and children of vets are discouraged because one of the points in the last IOM report had to do with spina bifida, which was a condition which Dr. Schwartz just talked about the compensation for. And you change the category of evidence for spina bifida in the children of, um, of vets from one where you said that there was limited evidence to one in which you um, indicated that the evidence was um, insufficient. Yes. And, um, and potentially that could cause the VA to reconsider spina bifida benefits and, um, and remove them, although Dr. Schwartz is shaking I mean, when I would shake no. my head. No. Okay. No, no. So, uh, Those two things are really not connected. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, but that was still a bit of discouragement in the sense that, you know, after this was raised in the Children of Ranch Hand study that basically you pointed out there hasn't been anything else. And so um, what does that tell us? Well, you know, you have to sort of step, take one step back and, and recognize that we are confined by the uh, uh, mandate that we get on the request from the VA, right? And so our request, you know, from the VA is to look at the weight of the scientific evidence, right? And look at the totality of that evidence to uh, evaluate whether there could be limited suggestive evidence, no evidence, or you know the different categories that we have. And so we're constrained by that definition. And so when you apply that call and that request from the VA, uh, we're obliged to look at the totality of the evidence, and the totality of the evidence led us to that conclusion. Um, what that tells you is it reinforces the very question that you asked us at the beginning, which is, do we need additional studies? By all means, because if you don't have the data, there's no way that you can continue to support a conclusion, but lack of evidence is no evidence at all. So it kind of makes a full circle. It does make a full circle. And, and <clears throat> I just want to amplify what you said because it's, it is kind of a disappointing when you hear insufficient evidence, but what he's really saying is there is no data. There's no studies. And so it doesn't mean this couldn't be true. Correct. Uh, it sounds like it says, well, we looked at it and there's no. But there's not enough data. And that goes back, as she mentioned, to your very first question. There's not been a lot of studies of uh, the effects of Agent Orange on Vietnam veterans or their offspring. And so it's, I, it's a misnomer in a way. And it's very disappointing when you hear that.
Yeah. So I have two quick questions, then we're going to open it up to the audience for, for questions and comments. You know, one is, uh, this one quickly, and then I want to uh, ask the last one, which is sort of a more thought-provoking philosophical question. Legislation has been introduced in the past few Congresses that would create a research center within the VA to study toxic exposures. Um, the VA has opposed this, and um, is this a good idea? It is a good idea, um, but I think that when it comes to certain, as Dr. Ramos mentioned, the partnerships with academia, um, VA does not have, VA has a robust research agenda and people that are very good at it, some of them here today. But when it comes to looking at the physiology of um, cells and, and, and generational effects and reproduction, that may not be the forte. And so um, I, uh, I think we all are in agreement that a study needs to be done. If the Center for um, Hazardous Exposures on the Battlefield is housed within the, uh, within the VA, my major concern is that we have to have really strong language that the Department of Defense will have to also be partners in this. But when you want the most up-to-date technology, then you need to go to academia and to yeah. the, 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 those people to really uh, unravel this mystery. Right. Uh, I think the straightforward answer to your question is yes, it is a good idea. And um, just to kind of parlay on the last question a little bit, one of the most frustrating things I see when I represent a veteran is oftentimes when a claim is denied, the VA attorney says, well, the IOM said there's no evidence. And like we just talked about, that's not correct. Insufficient evidence is not the same as no evidence. Yes. Maybe there's insufficient evidence of a presumptive benefit. However, maybe there's enough evidence for this individual veteran with this family history and this fact pattern. But without fail, if it's not a presumption, they say IOM says no evidence. And you see that mis quoting of these reports all the time. And so if there is more data and there is more evidence and more straightforward uh, research that's available, I think that would absolutely help in the adjudication of claims as well. Um, so this is a, a, should there be more research? Absolutely. Obviously there's a huge gap in research in this situation and has caused this issue. Um, with that said, there's also a lot of things that we can do right now that will face on the issue of Agent Orange. That would be the VA has records of every service-connected individual in this country who has been connected from their service because of their exposure to Agent Orange. A survey to those families about their children. Ask. Ask. The, the question was posed, Does the VA is the VA listening? The IOM report stated there's a biologic plausibility, you know, with um, animal studies. We recommend more research. And we've been asking. This has been going on for decades. And this is, this is criminal to what has, been happen, has happened to our families. It's been a genocide to our families, to our fathers, and to, the, our, fam and to our ch children, and now and grandchildren. Um, there needs to be research. However, there are some very basic things that can be done right now that we can do without having to, um, to do a lot of other groundwork because we have information. The Agent Orange Registry, per se, as well. Research absolutely has to happen. But parity among, among groups. The women Vietnam veterans, they did a self-report survey. The VA looked at their medical records. Um, they looked at, they took in the numbers and they came up with this list. Congress passed this list. There are 18 plus birth defects in the, uh, so uh, to say, on this list. Um, my birth defect, I have a letter from the VA that says if your mother served in Vietnam, then your birth defect would be covered. But your father served, so um, too bad to you. The VA website itself says that the women's birth defects, children's birth defects, were not caused by herbicide. They were caused by a woman's service in Vietnam. It's discrimination because my parents, because I'm telling you right now that they could solve and they could protect the most vulnerable of our population by simply a legislative or just a, a simple process of saying fairness. Why do I as a child of a male Vietnam veteran have to prove that my birth defect is caused by Agent Orange when the children of women Vietnam veterans who I'm so thankful they get benefits and I'm so happy for them, but it, we also have to have fairness. And in Australia, 
It does Let not me interrupt you there. I want to leave room for Dr. Ramos, ahead, and then, then go ahead, Dr. Ramos. Uh, so refresh me. The this is just about legislation to create a, a research oh, yeah, center. Yeah. Um, I was so deep into her yes, comment me too. that I sort of totally <laughs> lost. Uh, um, uh, yeah. I mean, the answer is yes. Um, I mean, we. Th this okay. is the right way to tackle the question, uh, and I reinforce, you know, Dr. Schwartz's comment initially, which is. That, that the attempt has to be done through a coalition that brings in adequate expertise and adequate resources to be able to ask the questions in the most uh, appropriate and efficient way. I'm going to save my last question for after our Q&A because I, I want to go right now to the audience to, um, to give time for their questions. Uh, we have a microphone on both sides of the room, actually. So if you don't mind stepping up to the microphone, and introducing yourself, and then uh, and and to ask your question, please. Uh, good morning. Morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for the information they provided. My name is Reginald Van Russell Sr. I served 23 years in the United States Army. I served six months in Fubai, Vietnam, and six months in Da Nang. As far as to care for him who has uh, borne the battle, this hadn't worked for me. I fathered five children. The first one that was born died immediately after he was born, nine months. Men and wife had two miscarriages right after that. My third child that was born has mental problems. My fourth child was born in the grave. So to your question up there, is that toxic legacy uh, hurting the children? Yes, it is, because that's my child. That's my child in the grave. This is the obituary. This is, I had to go sign to get. VA, the VA knew that they hurt us. They knew it back in early, early days. But you know what they did? They took over. They're saying that it took money. It was too much money to compensate us. That's my son. I served honorably. And when I put in for my granddaughter, who was my son's daughter, VA denied. There's something wrong with that. Is something morally wrong with that to send us to war? And then you got all these veterans with the same problems. They have the same problem. We come back, I had a rash on my hand I couldn't get rid of for 15 years. It stayed on my hand. I came back with headaches. I went out to Vietnam a month. I had headaches. I was in Portland Naval Hospital. I still get headaches today. I got a lump on the side of my head. I got a lump in my groin. It is really sad that the American government has sent our soldiers off and sprayed that stuff on us and brought us back, and our children are infected. The male and female, when they conceive, it takes two. But you're going to provide for the female, but the male took a part in this here. The female didn't, didn't get that baby just by smiling at the man. The man had to do something to get that baby, so he had a part in it. And it's wrong the way the VA is treating us today. So I, I want to, do you have a specific question, or, or can I ask a question based on your story? Uh, I, that's all I want to say. I, 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 I sit here, excuse me one moment. Yeah, I sit here and listen to all about the data and all the data. It's nice to have all that data, but I, I'm part of the data. I'm here. I, I got children in the grave. Uh, and I think that is so important. Uh, we should have said from the outset that you know one of the things that ProPublica and the Virginia Pilot have done is to gather stories. So not data, gather people's stories like yours. And we've heard from 5,500 veterans and their children, their stories. And one of the things that we hear time and again are stories like yours. So these are real people, right? Yes. Uh, I, I've seen people wear buttons that say, I'm an N of one. Uh, you know, I, I am a, I'm a data point, but I'm a person. Um, Dr. Schwartz, uh, you know, you, we, we have heard anecdotes like this where 
people have extraordinarily compelling stories about what has happened to their family. And it seems that perhaps those stories get lost. Um, Let me say, I, I can't imagine the pain that you are having. I have and every day, I, man. And, and your family. Let me say that this is a new day. And we are going, if, if we can move forward with this, if we can get this study, I know you've heard this before, and so have I. We will do this, not just for the ones who have passed away, but for the ones who are yet to be born. That's what we will do. Heather, do you want to add a thought? Because you probably do hear the stories like this. Yes, my heart breaks for you because I understand quite is very close to home for me and for many of my friends and my family. So um, thank you for your service, sir. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, Mike? Is it, can yeah, you hear on. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I, my name is Moki Porter. I'm the Director of Communications for Vietnam Veterans of America. And man, Dr. Ramos, when you said that we have to look to the future, to the future generations, I am completely with Heather on this. We absolutely want this never to happen again. But there is the time for, for these children and grandchildren is now. They need the answers. They're desperate. My colleagues, Rick Weidman and Dr. Schwartz, have been on this trail of tears is really what it is for many, many years now to Vietnam, back and forth. We've just completed our 237th town hall meeting. and. We have heard stories like his and like Heather's. It's happening in Vietnam. There's no science. Why? What, what is it that is going to make the science happen now if the political will is not there? We have this new, <laughs> this new <laughs> Betty McDecky has a national birth defects registry, the only one that, as far as I know, that's tracking um, scientifically. Kova is doing it anecdotally. We're doing it anecdotally. You're doing it anecdotally. Have you looked at that registry? Have you talked to Doc, to Betty McDecky? This new science of um, you know this sperm epigenetics is brand new. Yes. What about the ranch hand samples? They're still available. Why can't we look at those with this new science? So there's a couple uh, new there's a couple questions here. I want to make sure we get to both of them. Uh, one of them is. Um, the ranch hand samples, right? You talked about how you reevaluated some of the data. There are samples sitting in freezers yes. from ranch handers. And for those of you who are not familiar, ranch handers were the guys who sprayed Agent Orange. And they're sitting in freezers and available for scientists to do research on. Um, is that being done? No, not to my knowledge. The, the answer is yes, to a limited, limited extent. Uh, you know, th there was an appropriation that was made. Uh, for uh, the IOM uh, to manage a repository of samples and to actually put a call for proposals out uh, for focused studies that would utilize the samples. And in fact, uh, I've completed some of those studies and I'm actually working to analyze the data uh, that, that we've collected from those samples. But that effort has been limited. Uh, and Efforts like that need to be expanded. There's no doubt about that. Uh, if I may respond, you know, to to your uh, point, uh, I definitely hear you. And I, when I responded to the question, I didn't mean to project it only to the future. We certainly should be acting now. Uh, I like the suggestion that was made by Dr. Schwartz that you know one of the things that could be done to mobilize you know the process is to actually go back to the data that is actually in hand. And, and begin to mine that data and, and interpret to the extent that you can, even if you end up raising more questions than you, you know, gain answers. But the effort, I think, is worth making. So but I'm I not in any way minimizing the need to have a call to action that it's got essentially two parts to it. The immediate component, which is what can we do now to begin to try to get some answers, but the reality of the process is that the majority of what we will have to do really will have to focus on what can we do as we march forward because, as I said before, we cannot go back to reconstruct what cannot be constructed. But right? I do, but I want to fo follow up because of what you said, Moki, which is 
And, and Heather, you raised this too, right? So you have 700,000 people who signed into the Agent Orange Registry where you know those people have contact information. You have a million people currently from the Vietnam era who are getting benefits from the VA, I'm sorry, who are getting health care from the VA currently within the past year, uh, according to VA data. Um, why couldn't those people be contacted and say, tell us about your children? And Absolutely. why, you know, like even if you can't do the samples within their blood, like why, even something that just try to construct something epidemiologically or through survey information to just begin expand the knowledge base? Um, one more point. One more point and then we'll, For yeah. Dr. Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz, during our travels across the country, reaching out to our veterans and their families and their communities, we have been encouraging to them to do a number of things because we know that this research is going to happen and that we, <laughs> Um, and as we move along, we are finding that we're losing too many of the kids and the, the parents. But what we're doing is asking them to file claims in Denver, knowing that they're going to be denied. So the children and the grandchildren are filing claims. What mm -hmm. is happening to those claims, do you know? I think we just heard the answer to one yeah. of them. They're and I, I think that because mm -hmm. when you're doing benefits, it's just the straight away. It says the children, not the grandchildren. <laughs> And um, I'm, I'm sure that's what they're basing. Just like, as you right. mentioned, presumptive disabilities are much easier than those that are not presumptive. Right. So I, um, I would imagine that they're getting denial letters. But they're being kept on file, so when the research shows that there might be a grain of truth. I can't answer possible? that question, but I'll certainly look into it and because you raise, good trust. you raise a good question. Thank you. All right, thank you. Please. Oh, I just want to, one last Please. thing. When I was in Oklahoma, there were three Blue Water Navy veterans who served on the Midway. All three of them had Parkinson's. That's an introduction. <laughs> uh, over here, and then we'll come back over here. Hi, I'm Vicki Davey. I'm a VA scientist, and I want to thank ProPublica and the Virginian Pilot for, for hosting this. I am um, principal investigator of a study called VE Heroes, Vietnam Era Heroes. Um, it's a, a national survey uh, now 40 to 50 years after Vietnam of Vietnam in-country veterans in the war theater, Vietnam Era veterans in comparison to the U.S. public Vietnam generation. The major question in the study is, am I different? is the Vietnam veteran different than the U.S. public and the other um, service members who served in the time but not in theater. Um, but we are asking, do your children, do your grandchildren have um, the nine conditions that are best thought to be inherited um, um, epigenetically? We are asking uh, for the health of Blue Water Navy veterans, and we're asking a number of questions about the current health of all of these groups. So it's a big epidemiologic look that hasn't been done um, in this comprehensive a way since the CDC did the Vietnam experience studies um, back in the late 80s. And when do you expect um, the results to come out? So we'll go in the field with the, the um, survey questionnaires in mid-fall. Um, we should begin to have data back um, and cleaned, beginning to be analyzed in the following spring to summer. So. May I say, ask something? Please. Um, so one of the good things about that's amazing, and I'm very excited about that, but however, there's like m many, and I don't maybe you have some statistics from the VA, but how many Vietnam veterans who've been service-connected have already passed? So it's very difficult because, you know, yeah. my father's passed and I have birth defects. So that's one of the things that I'm wondering, is the VA taking that into? So we are doing a companion mortality study to the, the current health study. And we will, we will look at that. We are actually going to do a mortality study of the entire 9 million Vietnam era population in the same way with appropriate comparisons. So it will ask And have a similar more question. answers about that. Uh, originally, we thought that um, death rates were not different from the U.S. public. But uh, increasingly, I think there's evidence that they are. Now, whether they're different by condition is really the interesting question. And there's also that interesting evidence that's come out pretty recently, right, about the economic effects on the children. And I know that that's Absolutely. not within your area of, 
of study, but showing uh, economists have looked at uh, among uh, children of men who would have been whose draft numbers would have been called versus those whose draft numbers weren't called and showed pretty significant economic differences in earnings over uh, in subsequent years for children of vets, which is a pretty interesting finding. We will collect data on socioeconomic status and the common measures so we can take a look at that on health effects. Great. So thank, thank you. you. Do you have a timeline for this research, the study, the results? When will we see it? So we will be mailing surveys to a random sample of Vietnam, Vietnam era veterans in the U.S. public beginning in the fall. Um, Data will be returning over next winter. We will begin to have preliminary reports in the spring of next year. And then research, it's a vast data set, lots of questions. It's a long survey that'll go on for years, but preliminary um, will be <laughs> coming in the <laughs> summer, spring. Great. We will be following up on it. You could be sure of that. So uh, we have it on tape. So, OK, please. Good, good morning. My name is Tom Snee. I'm the National Executive Director for the Fleet Reserve Association. And Thanks for being here. a couple things that I have, and I have nothing to deny all of the herd of the children of Agent Orange. But the thing that I want to direct directly to is the IOM study that I, yes, painfully I've read through, and it has to deal with Blue Water Navy. Yeah. Now, from the VA side, they said that it is impossible scientifically that anything could have gotten out of the rivers into the within the territorial waters. Being a retired school teacher, yes, territorial waters is taught is 12 to 13 miles. It does get into the ciliation process, and that's a known thing. If you didn't have it beforehand, why is it all of a sudden? We also have the issue of the Australian report, and that was very con concrete, to say the least. But this line that says, no, we're not doing it, is for legislation Congressman Gibson has a bill on the thing about Blue Water Navy, as well as uh, the great Senator Gillibrand up in New York. So we have this thing, and I personally went with my national president and asked the VA secretary, why did we draw the line? He goes, it wasn't scientific. So well, I, my question is, what do you mean it's not scientific when we know that these waters do get into the ships? I understand about shipboard processing after they go through shipyards and they get cleansed and everything. But the thing is, if they had it because, why is the Blue Water Navy feel shunned out because they quote unquote, they weren't boots on the ground? And so it, it's, it may be helpful to, for the audience at home and those in the room to explain the context for this question, which is involving Blue Water Navy veterans. And the VA's policies allow for um, a presumption of exposure, meaning that you're presumed to have been exposed to Agent Orange if you were boots on the ground in Vietnam, meaning you were on land, or if you served in one of the um, Vietnam's inland waterways. But for those who served uh, offshore, it is, it is viewed as um, that you were in that you were not exposed, and you have to actually show on a case-by-case -case basis exactly. and exposure. And there is a major effort underway among Vietnam veterans to. Um, have the Blue Water Navy veterans to consider to be presumed to have been exposed so that they would be entitled to the same benefits for the same diseases as those who served on land. And this has been probably is the hot topic right now yes. when it comes to VA benefits. So I just wanted to right. provide no, a little bit of context and then and, uh, and, Dr. Just to, and just to give for the audience sake, yes, there is a list of ships and squadrons and it's just not sailors, but it's Marines and Coast Guardsmen were equally involved with this. And, and Mike and I have done a couple pieces on this, and uh, on our site we, we have a lot of information, but Dr. Ramos, Blue Water Vets. Well, so, you know, uh, I guess the short answer to that uh, very important question is that uh, we actually uh, uh, debriefed Congress on this particular issue and uh, uh, looked at the evidence. You know, the IOM, you know, did a study uh, uh, related to this, and the uh, recommendations that were made is that there are uh, at this point in time, no scientific basis to exclude, you know, the uh, Blue Water uh, Navy veterans, you know, because... Uh, Although I have to tell you that in the VA's um, literature, they actually flip it around and say there's no scientific evidence to include. So when they are sharing information with Congress, you just said there's no scientific evidence to exclude. To exclude. They're turning it around and saying there's no scientific evidence to include, well, and that's how they're... Uh, in in our uh, uh, report to them, that's essentially you know what we uh, stated. But but which way do you view? Which you just said, it's no scientific evidence to exclude. So that 
you know, we, we go back to the same uh, circular uh -huh. argument. You know, lack of evidence is no evidence at all. Right. And so that's essentially, you know, the, the, the place where you find yourself in trouble. Uh, if uh, part of the study actually involved, you know, the whole issue of a distillation, uh, water capture and distillation, you know, and, and concentrating uh, uh, of, of chemicals that might have occurred. And uh, as you know from the Australian study, that actually is what the evidence uh, uh, suggested. But the reality is there isn't, you know, enough uh, information, as I said, you know, to exclude. Uh, okay. okay. So Dr. are you disqualifying the uh, Australian report? Doctor? No, no, I'm actually uh, crediting the report and indicating that uh, uh, while there isn't enough evidence, the one study that was done to address the issue provided some evidence that would suggest that, yeah, there was an opportunity for exposure. Do you want to address that, Dr. Schwartz? I'm not really that well versed in the exclude and include uh, <laughs> on that. Um, I do know that they have had expanded the number of, of vessels that were uh, in that category, but I really, um, I think it goes back to the, and I'll go back to what I said before, it goes back to when you say there's insufficient evidence in, an, in a report. It makes it sound like we looked at it and all of the data said no. And, no. and, and, and we need to, and I have begged them uh, personally to change the way they say. It's better to say there's no evidence, there's no studies, and we, so people will know, oh, it's We can't not. answer the question. Yes, you can't answer the question because there's no information there. Instead of saying it's insufficient. I know I'm uh, uh, crying in the desert here, but that's, that's one of the things I think is a real downer for veterans when you say there is no, and they're looking at themselves and they're looking at their children. It, it is the terminology that you choose to report. Yeah. Uh, so we have time for these two quick questions, and then I want to uh, end with a question of my own. So uh, please. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak. Uh, Mike Ragret from the Chapter 415 of the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania uh, organization. Uh, and uh, listening to what you all had to speak about today, uh, being a Vietnam veteran, 68, 69, during the Tet, I was a Brown Water Coast Guardsman who served in the Mekong Delta. And in 2008, I came down with a presumptive exposure with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which I had to live with the rest of my life. Uh, but I don't want to harp on my issues with my current health status, but listening to you talk about data, research, funding, information. It, it, it sounds like the cat or the dog running around trying to catch its tail. We're not doing anything as far as going forward. As I look at in the Vietnam Veterans of America magazine every month, and I see that section called TAPS, and I see so many veterans, my fellow brothers and sisters, who are dying because of Agent Orange issues be it ischemic heart disease, be it cancers, be it uh, a peripheral neuropathy, uh, uh, it's just endless, not to mention PTSD issues and suicide rates, that it's hard with all of us having that clock of life ticking away so fast and celebrating 50 years now in, in, in our current time since the Vietnam War so many veterans are dying away, and that is where your research really should lie. Because without the veteran, it's hard to follow the path that Agent Orange is going to progress with our children and our grandchildren. Mike, let me turn that into a question, if you don't mind. Sure, which Charlie. is, is there a sense of urgency knowing that, you know, people are, you know, <laughs> that the generation is moving toward an older age and may not be around too much longer? I would say there is. There is, and we know that um, from various other studies that are saying we need to get this information now. And I will go back to my original point. Um, we need to do this now because of the Vietnam generation, but at the same time, we need to inform the process and build the process to serve those who are serving today. Yeah. I mean, our call to action, remember, it's been over 10 years. 
So, you know, we've repeatedly been saying, you know, the idea that additional research in specific areas is needed. Um, and so I, I hear you. Uh, but, but if I were cynical, I'd say this is being ignored, right? If this, you just, to your point, that, that it's been a call to action for 10 years, um, and we're talking today that maybe now people are listening, but. It, it's an interpretation. It's, it's I, just, okay. Dr. Ramos, it's just that time is just keeping on going and going and going. Yes. And m with my fellow brother who's with me today, we're at that age where so many of our veterans are passing away because of issues, because of our health. And we're going to be gone, just like our World War II and our Korean vets are leaving us so fast. We're leaving just as a faster rate than, than they are. I think that's an important point. So and, thank and, you. And, yeah. and even, you know, my two children, my two children I was blessed with that currently have no health issue, and they're, both girls are at age 40, one daughter's married, one daughter refuses to get married because of issues that her father had with cancer. She's afraid to get married and have children who's gonna have problems. But my daughter who is married with her third child, my, my youngest grandson, who had a brain clot, had to be removed from his skull. You know, he's only nine years old right now. But a couple years ago, they had to remove a four inch section of his brain to remove a massive blood clot that formed. But he also has attention deficit disorder, he has anger issues, and I can't help but feel as a responsible veteran who served this country and was exposed to Agent Orange that I have uh, passed that along to, to my family. And I may not be around when that grandchild reaches 50 years old, 60 years old, when, when I came down with cancer, and, you know, what's going to happen to my grandchildren 20 years from now? And I think what's going to happen to those grandchildren, you know, 40 years from now because of issues that happened to me when I served my country? Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Rick, do you have a quick last question? I do. It's uh, the Australians have, have done three complete epidemiological studies of their air forces, their ground forces and their naval forces, which is how they came to the anomaly of the naval veterans having higher cancer rate, and they couldn't figure that out, higher than the ground pounders. Yeah. All three groups were higher than the Australian general population. Um, seems to us that a good democracy does that for their armed forces who they put in arms way. You're talking about red prospectively, then they can do that. And I guess my question is, uh, Linda, you say it's a new day. For all of you, why is it that VA in the last 40 years hasn't spent a dime that wasn't specifically mandated by the Congress on uh, toxic wound research? And they're still not doing it today with the notable exception of uh, Dr. Davies' study, which we strongly endorse. Uh, so the question I ask is, do you believe that we can generate a change, a sea change in the public where they demand of the Congress that a complete epidemiological study be done of all of our troops and their families? Just, are you talking about everybody, not just Vietnam? Not just Vietnam, I, every cohort. I, I have to tell you, from your lips to God's ear, I hope so, because the people serving really now, the v Vietnam veterans, anyone who makes the commitment to serve this country deserves to have that kind of information available. We have not looked at it, we being the VA, but from the other side of the perspective as a veteran, that is why I embarked on this that is why I, I, may, I never thought I'd be looking at Agent Orange, but the point was too many of my friends were dying and there were no answers. And so what we have come, we have the expertise. What, what was said pre previously is the political will, and I'm not just talking about the Congress. The people of America have to want to have this kind of a, a dialogue. They want to have this information available to them in now and in the future. Right. Um, well, 
I can't speak for, for what the VA is doing or not doing and, and what they're choosing to spend money on, but as we've discussed with one of the last questions, I think absolutely this information would be useful, would be helpful, and um, likewise, I hope that we see it. Heather? I agree. I think what he says about the Australians are very, very true. The Australians have always been in the lead when it comes to doing research and taking their military service personnel with um, respect and to actually look at all issues regarding their health and welfare. Thank you for that comment. And Dr. Ramos, last comment. Agreed. All right, so you got four agrees. So, uh, <laughs> Charlie, can I just say, can I just ask one quick question? Please, Stephen. Please, I'm sorry. I, <clears throat> just because I, I, I don't want to, I wanted to nip this in the bud uh, because, Doc, you say things like, uh, you know, we cannot reconstruct what happened in the past. But I guess I put this to Rory. It, isn't that sort of one of the tenets of our justice system is is sort of to reconstruct what happened in the past? Isn't uh, like when we're looking at a, a crime had occurred or whatever, we look at DNA, we look at things that happened in the past and we try and reconstruct to figure out, you know, if some wrong was done. I mean, so we sh we can reconstruct some, and we sh shouldn't shouldn't we? I mean, shouldn't we pursue it just as a form of justice? I think there's certainly a component of equitable relief that um, when you spend so much time focusing on scientific data points and some of the comments we've had here have said, yeah, we get it, we need data, but you know there is something to be said for equity. And equitable relief is a component of our justice system. And it's yeah, maybe we don't have the science, maybe we don't have the data, but the information is right in front of you, and even without that, it's hard to say no. And so um, I think that you're right, that we, we do have a duty to look into that. Well, you know, I didn't say that there was no value in reconstruction, right? right. You know, the principle of reconstruction is important. What I question is the, the, the gains that you're going to get from the reconstruction, because in this particular case, you're trying to reconstruct in the absence of any data that you could use to kind of put the pieces together. And so in the absence of that data, you're really not able to reconstruct. When you use the example of the accident, you notice that a lot of the ability to reconstruct that you know, scene mm -hmm. uh, really depends on the quality of the data that was accumulated and the immediacy of looking into it shortly after it occurred, because if you don't, then dust is going to accumulate on top of the evidence. And if I can just follow up with one more thing, I think one other thing that we can be better about in terms of some of these situations is you know, we've largely been focusing on studies of the group. You know, what can we learn from studying from the group? But as we've also touched upon, these people are individuals. And one thing we struggle with a lot when we represent individual veterans is CNP physicians not taking the time. They look at you and say, oh, you don't have a presumptive condition. Oh, well. And they don't go into the medical history to the degree that they should and say, well, you were only this age when you got cancer. You have no family history. You were otherwise healthy. And there's not as much emphasis on the individual, and yes, maybe there's not enough to say presumptively overall this is what uh, the connection is for many veterans, but I think that we could do a better job, um, particularly on the benefit side, with focusing in on individual veterans and their scenarios to, to look at some of those pieces. Uh, so I, I, oh. I would like to add yeah, one, yeah, one point to that, uh, mainly because I wear a hat, you know, advocating personalized medicine. So I certainly echo the, the point that you're making. Uh, I should remind you that, uh, that the VA is now sponsoring something that's called the Million Veterans Project, which actually is the beginnings of attempting to look at individual information and sort of mine that information. So there's a lot of merit, I think, in the comment that you just made. So I want to give Dr. Rome an opportunity to, uh, who, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and then, um, please. This is going to be very short. I came to the VA just four months ago, and the first day I came in. Why don't you let everybody know who, what you yeah, do, who you are and what you do? My name is Dr. Peter Rum. I'm a, a pediatrician and a public health doctor. So I've actually worked in pediatrics for a number of years before going to public health. And I, I, I'm the director of what's called the pre 9 11 environmental health programs in the uh, post deployment health service, which is part of the Office of Patient Care Services. And that big name just means. We basically oversee a lot of the Agent Orange and uh, Gulf War and these things, along with other deployment-type medicine. Um, the one thing I want to add is that we are currently uh, really, the day I came in again was a, got a briefing on the IOM report. It was released the next day. And it's over a 1,000 pages, and it's a laborious. It, the committee's work was fabulous and outstanding. I think they really worked. They, we're going to be going back to them and asking this specific question about transgenerational effects in a, in a uh, we were able to get permission to 
get another volume of the Gulf of the uh, Agent Orange be done in the near next year, hopefully, uh, or the year after. And this is a topic that we're really going to push. And I just want to say that I, uh, in the VA, we have people like Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Davies and others that are just, they are committed to, to trying to f solve this. So the more information that gets out on this, I think, and the more public interest that government government reacts a lot, uh, keeping the, uh, those of you in the field that are in this and those are affected, uh, just keep pushing because uh, eventually things will happen. And I think the bottom line is that we care. Thank you. Well, so it sounds like we have some news there. So uh, uh, thank you for sharing that information um, with us. Uh, and thank you to our panelists for being here today. Um, you know, as I sit here and listen to this, uh, first of all, I didn't ask half of my questions, but this is sort of the life of the moderator. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that sort of my takeaway from this is that, you know, the IOM for a decade has called, has issued this call of action. And um, we are at a point where we're either going to answer it or we're not. And uh, I think that what we've heard from Dr. Schwartz and what we've heard from Dr. Rome is that um, they would like to seize that moment and answer the question. And I know that people in this room, uh, including the journalists here, will seek to you know ensure that we hold them accountable and ask the questions of where this is at. So uh, hopefully we will start to see the you know answers from those questions and that will inform the decision whichever way it goes and that we'll get evidence whichever way it goes but we have heard the personal stories in this room and what's what is a fact is that this is very personal to people and so in closing we uh, Mike and Terry Paris who's the community editor for ProPublica and I are going to be here after this forum and for those of you who want to share your stories we're, we want to be here to record them and so uh, we have we will be here for the next couple hours hearing your stories, recording your stories, and really encourage you to, to stay in touch with us. You can get more information at propublica.org slash Agent Orange. Our stories are linked to from there, as well as our survey of veterans and their family members. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you.